Hey, welcome to The Feast Life, where we empower you, the modern homeschool mom, to create a life in homeschool you love. I'm Julie Ross, the creator of the award-winning curriculum, A Gentle Feast, a homeschool veteran of over 20 years, and a certified Christian life coach. Charlotte Mason said, life should be all living, not a mere tedious passing of time. So on this show, we seek to savor the feast of life. So go get your favorite beverage and pull up a chair. You're welcome at this table. Hey everyone, welcome to The Feast Life. I'm your host, Julie Ross, and I am here today with the amazing Amber Leah, who wrote the book Triggers, which I'm sure so many of you are familiar with because it's been so beneficial and influential. So we're talking about that today and what the new things she's been working on and so many amazing things. So thank you so much, Amber, for coming on today to talk to us. Thank you, Julie. I have been looking forward to this and I'm so amazed at all the things that you do. And I know that your listeners are greatly blessed. So I'm excited to be here, be a little part of that. Yes. yes. So let's dive in to the book triggers first. Okay. Before we start that, if there are people who have not heard of this book or heard of you, give us the lowdown on Amber before we start. Okay, sure. All right. I had started out as a teacher And so I thought I was going to be an amazing mom and I was going to keep it really cool and chill because I knew how to manage kids in a classroom. And if you could do that, surely that translates into your home, right? And then I actually had children and it was a whole other story. And so my story of just writing and really having a ministry for moms who struggle with anger and yelling and things like that started just with my own personal transformation Mm -hmm. that God just started doing a work in me. And I grew up in a home that was fairly tumultuous. And I just thought, you know, when I'm a mom, uh, it'll be different. And I want to be this very gentle mom. I don't want to yell at my kids. I don't want to lose it. And so when I started finding myself in these very triggered states of mind, I was so conflicted because I loved the Lord and I loved my kids. And so what is going on? And is any of this even acceptable? Aren't I allowed to be a little bit upset when my kids talk back to me or you know whatever? And I could not wrap my head around it. Just that discrepancy between the motherhood picture that I had in my mind, who I thought I was, and then the reality of my everyday life. And so I just asked God to transform me. And I went through some very practical and specific things that God used to help me do that. And eventually he asked me to be transparent about it publicly. And that led to a support group online for moms in a Facebook group, which led to eventually writing the first triggers book with my co-author, my friend, Wendy Speak. And it has just progressed from there. And I remember vividly at the beginning, just saying to the Lord, this feels too big. There's so many angry moms out there. There's so many of us that are frustrated or struggling and I can't do this. So Lord, you're going to have to do it. And if you can use me in any way, then I'm willing to share my story because nobody really wants to raise their hand and say, hi, I'm Amber. I'm a recovering angry mom. But I have really found a lot of joy in destigmatizing this topic. And so that's me. I have four boys. We homeschooled, I think, almost every grade I've homeschooled except for kindergarten and or taught professionally. So lots of years in there, lots of experience and lots of opportunities to be triggered. Yes. But praise God, um, it can get better. And I hope that puts some hope in some listeners' minds. But my, I have four boys. We call it a testoster home. There's a lot of things, have a lot of smells and a lot of sounds. Okay. And I really wouldn't have it any other way. So that's me. We live in Tennessee and I have a girl dog. Hallelujah. <laughs> a girl dog. That's a little hilarious. Are your boys all grown now? So my oldest is 17. Oh, okay. So almost we're doing the whole college exploration thing and that's exciting and bittersweet at the same time. And then I have a 14 year old, a 12 year old and a happy surprise seven year old now. So we have a little bit of an age gap there, but yeah. We're trucking right along all the stages and ages. I was just going to say, yeah, you have the whole gamut, which is really fun. Yes, lots of opportunities to be triggered, especially I feel like teenage years creates a whole different um, set of fun. 
Yes. And similarly, having taught high school and middle school for oh. years, I thought this will be a breeze. And in many ways, it is. I think teenagers and preteens, adolescents are, were, they're underrated. Okay, they are. They're amazing. And that's a whole other conversation. But there it is. It takes a different approach in our mindset to not be triggered by teens and preteens in some ways. Just don't take it personally, friends. Just don't take it personally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, I think that boils down to a lot of it, too. But when they're teens, they've been with us for so long that they know all the little buttons and things to push. And I try to tell parents like, it's actually normal. It's like the toddler who's like trying to separate themselves from their mom. The teen is trying to separate themselves from you, but then they get scared. They get upset and they're like, mom, and they come back and forth and they do this as they, they're having to le learn to launch at some point. And that this is that's a true. normal part of that phase, but it don't feel good. Does it? Yeah. It's a dance. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So let's jump into kind of, in case someone's not familiar, it's a buzzword. I feel like these days, but how would you define a trigger? A trigger is anything that circumstantially, either internally or externally, just sets you off, okay? Gets your blood boiling, makes you angry, upset, frustrated. It's just that thing that happens and then you're like, okay, I'm reacting instead of responding. And they can be internal or external. They could be things like the house is messy, and there's just a lot of clutter and, or our schedules are just in a season where there's a lot going on, right? Or there's the situation where the siblings are not getting along with each other and there's all this sibling rivalry and it's just like too much for my brain that wants peace. <laughs> or there are things that are internal, things that really have more to do with us. It could be just that I'm not getting good sleep at night, whether you have a little baby and you're not getting good sleep at night or a toddler that's waking you up or you are perimenopause and you're, you're having hot flashes and you can't get good sleep, right? Or it's even the other internal things could be just loneliness. Sometimes we're in a state where just emotionally it has nothing to do with our kids, but awesome. we're more fragile. And so we're more easily triggered. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of opportunities there. For yeah. us to be either reacting or responding in a way that's going to either lead us down a path we don't want to go and maybe create some harm um, with our chip kids, or it could instead lead us in the direction of an opportunity for growth, um, both for us and for our families. Yeah, that's great. Those are such great examples. And I think that every mom listening can probably relate to all the things that you just mentioned. <laughs> and so sometimes you can work with the triggers, right? And you can get more sleep or you can come up with a better system to organize your house, things like that. For sure. But really, a lot of it we can't control. And so learning how to control ourselves is so key. So right. if a mother is willing to raise her hand... <laughs> Mm -hmm. and say, yes, I feel out of control with my anger, with some of these things that trigger me. And I don't want to react the way I'm reacting. I want to be proactive. I want to respond differently. I don't know how. Yeah. What's the first, where do we start? <laughs> first of all, lots of empathy and grace for those moms, because that was me. And I felt like I was the only one that was struggling in these ways uh, much of the time. And so my heart goes out to you, but the good news is there are things that we can do. So I'll tell you personally, here's what I did. I remember very vividly standing behind a closed door and my husband going off to work and I turned around and the house was messy and I love my kids and I am an orderly person. So I, they're little, they, they were four and under at that time, three of them. And it was just a lot to try to keep up with it. And I was in my pajamas, my husband's in his suit and he's going off and I'm, meanwhile, I'm here and I'm like, okay, what's, what are we going to do with this situation? And I just remember losing it and just, it, it just didn't take much, like just the, the mess and the chaos and someone's crying and I'm trying to make this person happy and I can't. And so I just remember being very frustrated. And then I, I'm ta talking way too loud than I need to. And, I, and then there's a knock on the door and I turn around and I'm like, oh my goodness, I really hope this person didn't look in the window and see all the chaos and the mess. I hope they don't see me and my disarray that I'm a mess. I hope they don't overhear me snapping and being short with everybody. 
And thankfully, when I looked at the little people, it was my neighbor down the street, an older gentleman who's very old, elderly and didn't hear very well, very right. hard of hearing. So I was like, okay, great. I don't think he heard me. And he was just returning a tool or something that he'd borrowed from my husband. And But that was a turning point for me where I was like, Amber, this is not how you want to keep waking up every day. Every day is the same. It's like Groundhog Day. Yes. Why, and, I, and you're praying. So why isn't this changing? Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking I used to spend a lot of time in my Bible and I still did, but it was a little sporadic at that point. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to get back, even though my kids are little and there's not a lot of free time when they have their naps and my kids are not really sleepers for that 20 minute <laughs> window where they're all sleeping at the same time. I'm going to get my Bible and just start studying about the tongue and about anger and how God is a father to me. And then I'm just going to follow that pattern because I had read a lot of books and I tried a lot of things and some of it was very helpful, but I knew ultimately I needed to get direction from the Lord, that it was going to be him that was going to change me. And mm -hmm. so I sat down in my chair and I just started studying and I would just take one trigger and one verse at a time wow. because there could be 20 things that we feel like we're grasping at straws and we're yes. reacting here and we're reacting there. And this sets me off and this sets me off. And this also <laughs> sets me off. And so that can be overwhelming and overwhelm is a choice. Yep. So I chose not to be overwhelmed and instead to sit down and really dive in. And like one um, verse was one of my favorite ones was Proverbs 29 11. And it says a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. And so I was like, okay, I want to be a wise mom. That's, of course, I want to be a wise mom. When I'm giving just full vent to my spirit, first of all, I'm not demonstrating a lot of maturity in any area, spiritually mm -hmm. or just <laughs> in general. I'm doing the same kind of behavior. I'm mirroring my child's behavior. And that's not what God's calling me to. He's calling me to something better and different. So I don't want to be foolish. I want to be mature. I want to be wise. So what is it? What do I do? I have to quietly hold it back. Quietly holding it back, that must look like keeping my mouth shut instead of instantly blurting what comes out. I need to plan a better response. I need to hold back what I typically say. And instead, I need to come up with and plan ahead a better response. I need to just pause and breathe. Like I like to call it a holy pause, right? So I would do a little, a holy pause and get my wits about me before I try to work on my child. And so I just sat down and I would just take one verse and one issue. Okay. I'm easily irritated. I say things I don't want to say. I'm just quick to react with my tongue. So I'm going to focus on this verse. I'm going to ask God to give me wisdom. I'm going to, I'm going to start being more quiet. I'm going to just going to lower the, the volume of my voice when I'm talking to my kids. I'm going to quietly hold back. I'm going to give myself time to do that holy pause and just breathe for a minute before I have to respond. And I'm going to just really focus on this as long as it takes for this to become a new response and a new habit in my life and a point of character in me. And then we'll go on to the next thing. Yeah. Okay. So it's very, I feel reasonable. <laughs> approach when we feel like we've got a lot going on that's overwhelming us. Yes. Yeah. I love this so much. I want to highlight out a few things that you did. So first of all, you chose to work on yourself. And so I think it's so easy to go, if my kids didn't talk to me that way, then I wouldn't respond this way. Or if, if my spouse helped out around the house and it wasn't so messy, then I wouldn't get overwhelmed. And, and we could put the focus on everybody else or all the other circumstances rather than going, yeah. how am I contributing to this? And what you're saying, it it's a habit. We respond because our brains and our neural pathways are used to going down that road. And we're used to doing the same dance of the same thing. And our brains just naturally do it. And so in order to break that pattern, you have to have that pattern interrupt, which is what you're talking about with that holy pause. I love that phrase. I've never heard of that before because it's naturally going there and you need to stop and go. And Charlotte Mason actually has a quote that I love where she talks about this. And she talks about and holding up like a no road sign. And saying, we're not going down that road anymore. And so I actually visualize myself like holding a sign up to myself going, don't go this way. It's <laughs> not good. Stop. Abort, abort, abort yes. mission. Yeah. <laughs> to train yourself in these new habits. And we think, like think of any habit, right? If you have like your New Year's goals and you try to do 10 things all at once, right? We all, it all falls apart by March. Because yeah. we can't do all that at one time. So picking one area, I love that. Like 
this one thing is setting me off. I'm going to focus on this one thing. And then when I start to respond differently, then I can add on something else. What happens is I would think that, correct me if I'm wrong, that once you get confidence in that area and see the results, it motivates you to keep going in those other areas too. And it's so true, Julie. And the other thing that happens is it only takes a little bit of change in us for it to have a big impact on our kids and the tone in our home. Like you may be working on that one thing, but it is remarkable how that impacts our kids. We don't even have to be dealing with them yet, but Mm. they pick up on that. Mm. And Mm -hmm. I think that those are some of the blessings of obedience that we experience as moms when we say, okay, Lord, work on me. Because obedience always gives birth to blessings. And so when we start to obey and say, Lord, okay, start with me. And by the way, repentance was a big part of that too. Like, I didn't just say, okay, change me. Cause I like, I was like, Lord, I, I recognize this is an area that is not honoring you mm. and it isn't pure. Yeah. <laughs> and I want you to purify me in this area and I confess it. And I trust that you are, this is a prayer. I know you want to answer for me. Yeah. So I'm excited. Like sometimes we think of this change, like we're so hard on ourselves all the time yes. and it's okay. How about we just be like excited that we know and can trust that God's going to step in and help us because he's going to honor our prayer like this. And there are going to be blessings from the obedience that you weren't even expecting. Yeah. And that's, that's really beautiful. fun. Yeah. Like the ripple effect, the com- um, atomic habits in that book, it talks about the compounding effect, right? Like it's, you know, it has all these things. So just picking somewhere to start sounds very doable and not so scary. <laughs> and remembering that it is not on us, right? We are partnering with the Holy Spirit and we have him to help us and guide us through this whole process. For sure. It's so great. Can we camp for a minute on two areas, two big triggers that I see a lot in the homeschool space and homeschooling Absolutely. provides such a wonderful opportunity to be triggered because you're with your kids 24 seven. And, and yes. And I think that's really helpful to point out because a lot of parents are like shocked that, oh, wow, all this stuff is coming up about myself through my homeschooling and they think something's wrong with them. And it's like, no, you're human. Have And this is just revealing it. So oftentimes we get so frustrated. And again, we try to control our kids and control the situations rather than going, okay, how am I contributing to this and taking the time? And that will change the atmosphere of our home and our homeschool and whatnot. So the two big ones I see, let's start with the first one is kids resisting school. So you've put all this work into it. You've made these beautiful plans. You set the table, it looks all lovely. And they're like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Why do we have to do this? Or whatever it is that they say. And it happens to all of us at some point in our homeschooling journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Has that come up for you at all? Oh, yeah. Has that come up for me? Yes, of course. This is a, a multi-layered issue because yes. every homeschool home is a little different. And all of the dynamics of our kids and how they respond and react to our good intentions to help educate them and grow them are going to be different, right? Part of it is knowing your child. And it's just that whole systematic process of studying our kids, finding out how they can communicate and the best way to communicate with them, the best way to help them learn, which Mm -hmm. is such a privilege as homeschools. And so as the mom who's homeschooling, I start again with me, like, okay, awesome. What a privilege and an honor that I get to help them work through this and grow. Like we're expecting when we're about to homeschool, we're like, okay, so we're going to homeschool. This is going to be amazing. And then the reality hits and it's got its challenges and they don't want to do what we're going to do. And we're like, look, don't you understand the blessing of what, what we're doing here? There's a lot of work here and now you don't want to do it. And then we take it personally, right? So it starts with me, first of all, not taking it personally, not going into victim mode, And then really getting the mindset of this is an opportunity. And I may have an opportunity here to either kind of overlook this and pivot and switch gears. And this is going to require the discernment of God in your lives and as an educator, because we're moms, but we're educators. And then the other part of it, too, is to just ask, okay, maybe this is actually an opportunity for me to do some real loving correction here. Mm-hmm. And to say, this is why we're doing this. I would often tell my kids, look it, we're required to do this. So it's not an option. This yeah. isn't me. There, There is framework beyond mommy yeah. that requires you to get an education and it's good. 
And God wants us to utilize the gifts that we have in our brains. So we're going to do this, even if it's uncomfortable. And we get to do this, yes. right? We get okay. to do this. You don't have to do this, but you get to do this. And this is amazing. So just the way we frame things with them. But ultimately, it's really coaching. So in any trigger, any situation that we face where things aren't working well, it's an opportunity to coach our kids in the right direction. So when a coach looks at their, their pupil, whether it's music or athletics or whatever the case may be, they evaluate their strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. and they don't expect them to perform beautifully on day one, right? They have to work with them and coach them through this process. And so for us, goodness, this is going to be about refining us and making us really patient. Yep. <laughs> We're going to have to be like, okay, this kid doesn't want to do this lesson today. They don't want to do the work. And if it's once in a while, I understand that as an adult, there's things I don't always want to do I'll that I, like, I don't want to be here either. <laughs> I'm obligated to do. Yeah. But if it's like someone who's just consistently butting heads, like, and there's just, we can't get anywhere day after day, then there's different things that yeah. maybe approaches you can do. But starting with me again, I'm not a victim. This is a blessing and an opportunity disguised right now as a trigger. And I get to get creative. And I, and you know what? Also, please just have confidence in your prayer life that God is going to help you figure out yes. how to move forward yes. with this child, with this situation. Yes. Yes. And don't think that he's not going to download to you how to move forward with this kiddo. Mm -hmm. We get to get creative and a little outside the box sometimes with our kids when we're homeschooling. And so we have that opportunity now when they're resisting. But after we've talked about it, after we've worked, after we've set the expectation, there's loving correction. We're not just going to be loosey-goosey and do a lot of permissive parenting. There are certain consequences that come in place. But again, how do I implement those? Do I just get so frustrated and yell at them in anger and punish them? Or do I have empathy instead and say, okay, I'm so sorry that you chose that because you know we've been working on this, that this is what we do at this time. And this is what we're going to memorize. And, and I'm here to help you. And I know you can do it, buddy. And if they just dig their heels in, and I've done the good work of really digging deeper. What's this really all about? Yeah. Are you hungry? Are you yeah. tired? Yes. Do you, did someone say something to you at, yep. on the way to the living room? Yep. And now you're just been out of shape, yep. not taking it personally. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but doing that digging. And then just at some point we are, we're just having that empathy for them. And we're just saying, look, um, let's figure this out together. But at some point, there are some consequences that come into play too. And that's our privilege to get to implement. But it's about me. How do I deliver that? I'm so sorry you made that choice. And you know, this is our expectation. And so now here's your consequence. But I know that next time you're going to make a better decision and come and get your work done with me. And we're going to have a good time. It's going to be amazing. But and I'm really sorry you made that choice. But here you go. We don't have yeah. to make it about us or get all angry about it. Yeah. And I think that's the key is we make it about us. It's I'm offended. I'm hurt. I might even have some shame because I'm like thinking I'm not a good homeschool mom already. And so now you're resisting. So it's just reinforcing the belief I already have about myself that I'm horrible. And so now I feel the shame. I don't know what to do with it. So I'm going to yell at you. And rather than deal with that really uncomfortable feeling of feeling shame or whatever that emotion brings up for us. And so I love how you reframed it. And I think that's so key because our thoughts and the way we're seeing things and the stories we're telling ourselves about what's happening really do affect our emotional state. And so seeing it not as, but as an opportunity, not as a battle is huge. And I love that you use that word opportunity. And I use that in my coaching as well, because it's like, you're saying you don't have to, you get to like, you are able to help your child make different choices and you are building and molding their character in a way that you wouldn't have if they were not in your home. And you, right. I love the, how you just worded that as like a coach, um, rather than like an, a, an authoritative, like up right. down kind of approach. Like I'm yeah. with you, we're working on this together and I want to help you get to this level. But I realize you're not going to be there. Like you're saying, I love the athlete example, right? Olympian tennis coach 
doesn't expect someone to come in the first day and be able to win the gold medal. Like you have to do the reps. So I'm here to help you keep doing all these reps of pushing right. through, doing hard things. And there's, I agree with you too. There's so much to that. When parents ask me that question, I'm like, there's a million different things that could be causing all of this. But first you have to work on your own mind and what story you're telling yourself about the circumstance. Yeah. And to be open and curious, I think that sometimes we want to fix the problem right away because that makes us feel better. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying to our child, one of my favorite questions for them is tell me more about that. Mm. Whatever it is, if yeah. they're like, no, I don't want to eat that. Well, yeah. Tell me more about that. What's going on with empathy and compassion first, not indignation. Mm. It's really easy to come at things with indignation immediately. Don't start there. <laughs> start with curiosity and empathy and ask them, tell me more about that. And that often uncovers whatever their resistance is or whatever their negative attitude is. Yeah. And we get to the root of what's really going on. And that takes time. So yeah. I think it's so important to mm -hmm. slow ourselves down. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, some of us as homeschoolers have more of a fast paced agenda. We tend yep. to be like, okay, super organized. And that's yep. me. Like I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a list. This is what we're going to do. And I really had to learn to go with the flow a little bit more with my kids and to take the time to find out what's really going on here and not just breeze through it. Because having been a professionally taught teacher teaching in the classroom for 10 years before I homeschooled, those are two different beasts. So I had to really learn to meet them where they were at and uncover some of the things about what's going on with them. And to realize that it just 99% of the time, it's not about me. For sure. And it really, that is the education that we're giving them. It's there's learning in these there's books and these things, but working on their character right. is an amazing gift that we have to work alongside of them as well. And that's going to really ultimately really shape who they become. So that's not right. like a distraction from your lessons, but I totally understand. And I talked to so many parents about this. I got to get through all this stuff and we feel all this pressure. So it's like, I can't take the time to sit down and have a conversation about why they might be doing X, Y, Z. We just need to move on. Just get with the program here, people. And let's keep going rather than, okay, no, this is the education. Hey, Julie Ross here. I am guessing you might be knee deep in homeschool planning for next year at this point. It's so fun and exciting, isn't it? But it can also be a little overwhelming and picking out all the best resources and figuring out what to do is a lot of work. And if you're anything like me, you can have all the best books and all the best resources, but when it comes to like, how do I actually plan out my days? <laughs> and what do we actually do on a Monday so that I could provide my children the most life-giving, nourishing, educational experience? It can seem a little overwhelming. So if that sounds like you, don't worry. I am doing a free workshop called The Five Steps to a Life-Giving Homeschool where I break it down with my very simple framework on how to organize your routine to create the most amazing homeschool filled with connection and creativity. And I would love to have you join me. It's going to be on June 24th. I'm going to put the link below to sign up. If you can't make it live, don't worry. There'll be replays sent out but I wanted to offer this free workshop to help parents create a very simple rhythm and routine to their homeschool days so that it can be the most life-giving experience. If you would like to join me, just go to thefeastlife.me forward slash life-giving homeschool. That's all one word. Again, that's thefeastlife.me forward slash life-giving homeschool, and we'll get you all signed up having this conversation, right. typical conversation and helping them see what they're doing is going to shape them probably more than that math lesson. So let's focus on this for a couple of minutes. Yeah. And then the more you work on it again, the less time that will take. The other area I see a lot with homeschool families, the other big trigger is sibling issues and fighting. And because we're all together again, all the time. And there's only one of you. And if you have multiple children, right, there's only, I wanted the red cup. I want to sit on mom's lap and all this trying to get like attention. And it can create a lot of stress for parents who are trying to, I'm trying to get through the geography lesson. Yes. <laughs> everyone just sit down and be quiet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And again, so I think it's really important that we base our confidence as homeschool moms on our intentions and not our outcomes. So if my intention is that I want to create a great environment for my kids, 
I want to educate them well. I want to meet their needs. I want to build healthy relationships between me as a parent and child and between the children together as siblings. Mm -hmm. That's my intention. And I don't need to get so worked up on the outcomes. When I focus on the outcome of that, whether or not everybody's always peaceful all the time, then I start to get panicky and frustrated because I'm doing the work and my heart's in the right place. And then they're fighting with each other or they're over here distracting each other or whatever the case may be. And so for me, that's very freeing in my own mindset to recognize, but my intention was this and we're working on it and it takes a childhood to raise a child. Mm. So I've got to have the long game in view. It's very easy to get myopic in this one moment right here where they're not. And instead of looking more at the big picture, But one of the things that I talk a lot about with my kids and being intentional is the way we honor one another, not just mom and dad, but honoring each other. In fact, there's a great verse that talks about outdo one another and showing um, brotherly affection and honor to one another. And so it's okay. My kids love to outdo one another. And in my book, Parenting Scripts, I I talk about this. All I have to do now is say to them, um, what can you do to outdo your brother. And they know immediately what that means. It's not to outdo them and trying to get this thing or distraction or whatever, or competition with each other or annoying each other. But how can you actually outdo one another and showing brotherly affection and then showing honor to one another? And we talk about that. It's focus on that again, as long as it takes. If I see an area where there's siblings that are not connecting well with each other, or there's an issue there, then I will lean in on that as long as it takes. And I will pray over them and I will talk with them about what are the benefits? What would it be like if we were always outdoing one another and showing honor? What would it be like if instead of sharpening your own pencil, you first went to your brothers or your sisters and asked if you could sharpen theirs? What are some ways that you can actually try to outdo one another and showing honor? And then in everything we do too, we're teaching them, Look, this is ultimately about honoring God. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it as unto the Lord. And so these are all teachable moments, not in a condemnation way. We do not want to use scripture like a dagger. We want to use it like a scalpel, very precise, very nuanced in a way that's going to do the least amount of damage because we don't want to get religious on them. We want to build relationship with them. And so just taking those opportunities, right? Those triggers are opportunities and they're signals. There's some work to do here between these two siblings, and we need to work on outdoing one another and showing brotherly affection and honor. And what are some ways we can do that? And then let's lean in on that trigger for a while and see where we can get. Yeah, that's great. That is, I know that would be so helpful to people. Now, what do we do when we've been working on this for a while and we've been making progress and we're recognizing our triggers and we're stopping to think about how we want to respond instead of reacting and we're taking time in God's word and taking time for ourselves and we're doing so well for a couple months and then something happens and right. (laughs) Okay. Can we just acknowledge that it's probably going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. So we cannot focus on being perfect. We have to focus on yielding to the perfecting work of the Lord. So this is about being perfected, not being perfect. Yes. So we are not going to get this right all the time. But I think one of the best things we can do is recognize it, stop in the moment. If you used to just say something and then just keep it going, but now you say something and you catch yourself and you're like, I apologize to my kids. I just tell them, look, you know what? I'm really sorry. I've really been working with the Lord and being on my patience and slowing down and, and breathing, but I didn't get it right today. I did the wrong thing and I am sorry. And that was sinful. And I should not have spoken like that to you, or I should not have said that to you. And so I just need to have a minute to, to just breathe and take some time to get back on track. And I model that for my kids. And I'll tell you what, now they're so good at self-regulating. They're so good at catching themselves. I'll see them in a conversation with me and they will literally go, okay, hold on. 
And then they just stop and take a breath. Wow, that's amazing. And then they come at me with a much gentler tone of voice. Mm. Like we know how to stop right in the middle of it now that's and amazing. to regulate that and then to try again. And that's another thing I'll say to my kids all the time is like, why don't you try that again? And then I have to say that to myself, Amber, try mm -hmm. that again. Yeah. You know what? You just started going off in this direction. Stop. And then let's try that again. And I say that with my kids all the time. And that's what's helped them get to the point where they can catch themselves in the middle of it because it's going to happen. But do we need to continue pushing all the cars off the train, the track, or can we stop and get that back on track and going in the right direction again? So it's not about being perfect. But we are going to yield to that perfecting work of the Lord day by day, moment by moment, and then stop. When you start feeling it going, it's okay for you to stop and say, I need to just stop for a second and stop talking. And I need to get myself back under control. I let my kids see me do that regularly. Yeah, and I encourage them to do the same. That's so powerful because if we just, we have a moment, we respond in a way we didn't want to, and then we let the shame and the guilt make us go hide in our room or shut down, or like you're saying, keep pushing and keep making it, the explosion even bigger. We're going to have a much bigger mess, but what an amazing opportunity we're modeling for our kids of this is how you emotionally regulate that they wouldn't get to see if we weren't growing as well. And so it's, those are actually really great opportunities, but oftentimes what happens is we just beat ourselves up because we didn't do the way we want. We miss that opportunity to demonstrate for our kids what repair actually looks like. Yeah. And I have a lot of empathy for moms who are dealing with guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. And I, we could spend a whole hour talking about that, but I will just say, I get righteously angry at our enemy mm -hmm. who tries to place that back on us yep. because it robs the power of the cross because Jesus died to take away our guilt and our shame. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to allow the enemy to put that back on me, I'm degrading that work that Jesus Absolutely. did for me. Mm -hmm. And I, and so I really want us to get good at, at casting that off and leaving it at the foot of the cross where it belongs mm -hmm. because Satan has a plan for our lives to steal, to kill and to destroy. And it does happen in the mind so often with that shame and that guilt. And Jesus came to give us life and to give us life abundantly. And so we have to take those thoughts captive and make them obedient unto Christ and say, you know what? That may have been true of me at one time, but that is not true of me now. That's not who I am now. Mm -hmm. And I am moving forward by God's grace. And I just cast that shame off and that guilt. And the Lord loves us unconditionally in the same way we love our kids and we want to keep pouring into them, even when they do wrong. I tell my kids all the time, even like they'll be totally fine. They'll just be out playing basketball. And I'll just be like, hey, Ollie, I just want you to know I love you even when you're naughty. And they like, I know. I'll say to my young guy, my seven-year-old, Quaid, I'll say, hey, Quaidy, guess what? And he'll say, you love me even when I'm naughty. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. like, they just know. As I'm trying to counteract any of that shame and guilt-based mentality from an early age for them. But we have to do that for ourselves sometimes because we feel so guilty. And I'll tell you what, your kids are so quick to forgive. You have not Beautiful. scarred them for life. And God can use anything, even the worst circumstance in parenting. I've seen some of the most lovely people come from some of the most horrific situations growing up. It's probably not our homes, right? We're, right. we're doing a lot of good work here. So we can just release all of that shame and guilt and get rid of it. We're focused on what's next and how we're going to, we get to grow and to get better, but we're going to accept Jesus's love and forgiveness and empathy. And we're just going to pass that right back to our kids. Yeah. It's so important what you just said about knowing and being firmly rooted in who you are in Christ to right. not fall prey to the, all that shame and that guilt and those lies. And that we can't have our children be secure in who they are in Christ if we're not repeatedly telling ourselves who we are. And I love that you said, I'm not that person anymore. And that's one of the things I say all the time. It's and again, in that holy pause, yeah. because the way that we view ourselves, the words that we tell ourselves about ourselves really do affect our actions. So if I'm telling myself I'm an angry mom all the time, right. Or 
I'm trying not to be angry anymore. <laughs> that doesn't sound like definitive and you really believe it. It's, no, I am not an angry mom. Yes, there, there are still going to be moments where I might say or do something I don't want to, but that doesn't defy me. And it's right. studies have shown people who say I'm trying to quit smoking versus people who say I'm not a smoker. The people who say That's I'm right. not a smoker are able to quit 80 some percent faster than the people who say I'm just trying. And so believing in God's promise that he is going to do a mighty work in you. This is not who you are and changing our identity. That must be so important. Absolutely. Yeah. It's key. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's so good. That's such I'm glad we touched on that. That's super important. So I wanted to talk to you as well, because I know that you've been working on this. I see it all on your Instagram and stuff. (laughs) I think this is, it comes together so well with the book triggers and talking about anger is also talking about moms taking the time to take care of their own health. Because if you're neglecting your health, oftentimes you're going to respond ways you don't want to respond. Can you talk a little bit about how, what you're working on now ties into what you've written? Absolutely. A few years ago, I came to the place where I recognized that sometimes part of my reactions were stemming from my sugar addiction and really my focus on food and really not taking care of myself. I wasn't getting enough sleep. I wasn't getting enough water. And I was eating sporadically based on just whenever something was available or picking off of my kids' plates, or when they would go to bed, I would collapse every night on the couch and have some rest time and maybe watch a movie or something with my husband. And I would have ice cream every night. And I thought that was like my, my pleasure moment, my self-care that I thought was pleasurable. Really over time, it led to autoimmune disease And I recognized that I was short. I had no energy. Oh my goodness. By two o'clock, I was done. And I used to be so energetic years and years ago. My kids would want me to come out and play on the trampoline with them. And I was like, nope, can't do it. I'm exhausted. And I just knew that wasn't the way to live. So then when my son Quaid was born, when I was in my early forties and I, he became two years old and we had this birthday party for him. And I looked at him and I was like, Amber, you are not in a good place. Like he, Mm. you're an older mom and he's going to grow up. And if you don't take care of things, like you're going to die. Like you're going to be actually in the nursing home, not on the cruise ship. And I wanted to be on the cruise ship with the family reunion. I didn't want to be in the nursing home. And I also felt this again, so clearly over and over again, it was like, okay, God, I know you've transformed me so many in so many ways in my parenting and in my marriage, but this is one area I've not given over to you. And it's my health and taking care of me. And I felt this very loving conviction. I never felt God condemning me, even though I was on the verge of being morbidly obese at that point. And I had been a very healthy adult before I had kids. I had struggled with my weight growing up. I got it under control and then it got out of control. And I was very much an emotional eater and stress eater. And I was letting that get to me. And so I felt this loving conviction that Amber, you're missing out on those blessings of obedience and taking care of your temple. And it's also causing you to be more easily triggered because of the chemicals. You've got this dopamine cortisol loop in your body with all this refined sugar and all this lack of sleep. And you're just making it harder on yourself emotionally. Yeah. Wow. And I knew it. So I was like, okay, Lord. And I prayed and I I tried things and not a lot of things worked. And then I ended up finding a really simple plan that made it easy for me as a busy mom. And I leaned in on that. And long story short, I lost 95 pounds in a fairly short amount of time, uh, but in a very healthy way. And God always has me in this place of, Amber, I know you'd like to go through this very personal thing privately, but I'm going to have you do it publicly. And I want you to help other people. So I was like, okay, Lord, I just leaned in and that became another really important part of the ministry of working with moms and just women in general is also letting them know you have to take care of yourself. It's not an option. Like you are not living life to the full if you are that unhealthy. For me to lose 95 pounds, I'm in the best shape of my life now. I'll be 50 next year. What? And you don't look at me yeah. close. 
Oh, thank you. Well, I received that, but I'm working out. I Now I'm in a phase where I'm really working on agility and balance and so muscle retention because I want to be that grandma that's yeah. like on the waterfall hike. I don't want to be back home because yep. yep. I can't go because I broke my hip. I'm just working on all of these parts of me. And I recognize so much like the energy that I have, the good sleep that I have now, how much the water has helped my skin and my organs, my autoimmune disease that I had for years began to recede within a few months, just because I was eating clean. Mm. It was crazy how much God used me being healthy and working on myself to actually filter down to my whole family. My kids have such healthy mindset about food and about sugar and about health and wellness and being active again, God working on me worked on my whole family. My husband ended up losing 75 pounds. My oldest teenager lost 45 pounds. They're all tri-sport athletes. They just, they're super active. So I know that's because of what God did in me six years ago. And now I've been maintaining that all these years and just really love helping other moms do the same uh, and help helping them value themselves and seeing how the fog is lifting now that I'm not addicted to sugar. I'm not quite so testy. Who yes. would have thought? Yeah. Yeah. And that's so amazing. Congratulations. That is huge accomplishment. And just to keep Thank going you. with that, especially in our society and our culture. And But I think it's such a valuable discussion. What you just said, that moms need to learn to value themselves enough to make the choice to start taking care of their health. Cause I hear it all the time of, I don't have time for that. I feel selfish going to the gym or whatever X, Y, Z waking up 30 minutes early to go work out of my garage or go for a walk in the middle of the day. Like I feel guilty. And so I'm not, but they don't realize like you are hurting not only yourself, but you are hurting your yeah. family. That's right. Yeah. So I just tell people don't feel that way anymore. Like just stop. <laughs> if you need permission, if you need someone to tell you, absolutely you for sure get to take three or four days a week where you go on a walk and you get to take a 20 minute nap and you can absolutely take a little more time to meal plan healthier meals then you have it like okay and we're gonna officially are- put it out it's yeah. gonna be in the show notes amber and i are gonna make a little certificate if you need to yes. print out a permission slip <laughs> You can show it to people. people. I'm allowed to do it. (laughs) Yeah. I'm, this is not a, this is not a pass. I have to do this. And that's why I wrote my book food triggers a year and a half or so ago, two years ago now, because it was really all of the different things that trip us up in our mindset, especially and practically that cause us to feel like I'm stuck. I can't, I don't deserve to. And that book goes through, I've, you know, worked with thousands of clients and coaching them in health and wellness. And so that book just came from all that experience myself and with them. And it's not even just about losing weight or sleeping better. Again, the spiritual growth that happens when you do everything as unto the Lord is profound. It is such a blessing. And it, again, it doesn't have to be hard or complicated. Taking care of ourselves one little thing at a time, working on some simple habits is super transformational in a short amount of time. And I want to give moms hope for that too, that you can grow spiritually in this area of your life. You deserve to focus on this area of your life and you it's not complicated. There's a lot of hope. If I can do it and maintain it. I promise you. So can you. That is so encouraging that it really is. And I think in my work with moms, a lot of them say, oh, I I wake up like early and I read my Bible or I wake up and I I go for a walk or I do X, Y, Z, but I just feel like there's something wrong with me. I shouldn't have to put this much effort into it. I'm like, why do we think that? Like any athlete, any like amazing person who like teaches at a really high level or writes books about whatever they do the work, like you were talking earlier about the coach, right? Like you don't have to do any of that. Like you can keep living the way you've been living, but if you want to change, like you have to do the rest. It doesn't mean something's wrong with you. Actually, it means something's really amazing about you that you are seeing. I don't have to stay here. I'm not a victim of my circumstances or my health or whatever, and I can change and I'm going to take the work and invest the time to do it. For sure. And Julie, one of the important things that you're touching on there is, and that I work with people on from the beginning is, is we get to part of the growth is that we get to now become a little bit more structured in our day. 
So if we want to be able to homeschool our kids, we want to be able to have time to go to the gym. We want to have time to read our Bibles. We want to be able to have a day of fully rest. Then we now get to become a little more structured in our day. It's amazing what happens when I'll be talking with someone and we'll take, okay, we've got 24 hours in the day. Let's break it down hour by hour, like what you're really doing. And all the things you could do. And when I tell them, okay, so let's say you have two hours for lunch and two Mm -hmm. hours for a date night with your husband and three hours for this or that. And they're like, oh, there's still eight or nine hours left. And I, I, and it's, yeah, like there's so much more time in your day than you realize when you, you take the opportunity to get more structured and intentional. It's amazing how much you can do. People say that to me all the time. How do you do all the things that you do? And I'm like, it's not that hard. Like you, we just have to grow and getting more, a little more organized into a rhythm of life and recognizing like what you were saying earlier, Julie, the stories we're telling ourselves, if we tell ourselves we don't have time. We won't. Absolutely. But if we say, Oh, of course there's opportunity. And I say this to my kids regularly, they'll say, Oh, uh, scarcity mindset. Also, like I don't have time to do my homework or whatever. And I say to them, there's plenty of time to do all the things that matter most. There's plenty of time to do all the things that matter most. And that's just a very peaceful, freeing mindset to embrace. And so we have to tell ourselves that, and remind ourselves that on a regular basis. There's plenty of time to do all the things that matter most. And moms, you matter. Mm. Mic drop moment. We're going to end on that because that is amazing. And that like, we're going to embroider that on a pillow or something like that. (laughs) There's always time for what matters most and you matter. That's right. That is beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on, Amber. Where could everyone find you to get some more information with all the helps and amazing resources you have? Oh, thank you, Julie, for having me. It's been so great. So super simple. You can just go to my website. It has all the things on it, but it's amberlea.com. And it's L-I-A is my last name on Instagram and on Facebook, Amber Leah as well, the real Amber Leah. Leah. And that's pretty much it. Who struggle with anger and it's called gentle parenting with Amber and Wendy. And uh, we also have a video series that complements our parenting books where they're just, they're short videos that you could do them on your own or in group study or at churches utilize them. Um, and there's a ton of freebies that come with them. Um, but those are at amberandwendy.com. Wonderful. Again, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Julie. Hey, 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 thanks for watching. If you liked this episode, please heart it down below and make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. Leave a comment and let me know what you learned in today's episode. I'd love to hear from you.